Welcome, new and old friends. My name is 242, and this spooky, scary Sunday, I have one story for you. Well, the start of a story. Remember, if you'd like to help this channel, subscribe, check out my merch, and Patreon. Turn off the lights, make sure your doors and windows are locked. Things are about to get spooky. I was never allowed in the basement. I finally found out why. Part 1 By Fleet Steps A day, a week, a year. Just arbitrary measurements of the relative forces that is time. One person's future is another person's past. And time is a fickle witch. Blah, blah, blah. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just start at the beginning and see where it ends up. Ten years ago, a drunk driver had killed my parents. He'd been driving on the wrong side of the road. Blew a point two two. At ten years old, my twin sister May and I became orphans. Ten years, and the pain of it has mostly subsided. Though, not entirely. There were still days I missed my parents. The way my mom used to kiss my forehead in the morning before school. The way my dad laugh used to fill a whole room with happiness. May and I had gone to live with our grandfather, our papa, as we had called him. And for a while, life went on. We had been close with him before, and he was more than kind to us. He really did his best to fill the void of our parents. It wasn't perfect, but we loved him for it. May and I stay close, grew up, go to the same state college. Life went on as it always does. That was until earlier this year when our papa was diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer. And then he too was torn away from our lives. The funeral was small, just us, a few family friends, and his brother. We had little family left other than our papa's estranged brother, Tom. Tom actually lived close by, and he and papa didn't get on well, though neither May or I knew why. It was actually a shock when he showed up at the funeral, didn't say much though, and left pretty quickly. May and I had returned from our school to deal with our funeral proceedings and to clean out our papa's house. I say house, but really it's a mansion, a gargantuan old gothic structure sitting on 10 acres of land snuggled up close to a dense forest. It would be creepy to anyone else, but to me and May, it was home. A shiny beacon of light in a world of garbage. Papa had left the estate, all of his possessions, and a very large bank account to us. On top of that, he left us a slightly disturbing letter. This is what it said. You both deserve the very best in life, and I'm sorry to say you haven't gotten that from me. In the time after my death, You'll both come to realize that I'm not the man you thought I was. Sometimes we do things we feel are necessary, and those things can haunt us. Tom has agreed to explain some of the things to you both. And I just hope you won't judge me too harshly. Papa was a saint, and neither May nor myself had any idea what the note was talking about at the time. We'd come to find out. Papa was also a serial hoarder. The house was full of junk he collected over the years. We used some of the money he left us to rent some storage units and a truck. But cleaning out the house was no small task. Papa had always been a private person 
and wouldn't have wanted strangers coming through and tearing this place up. So neither of us felt comfortable having movers come in. Still, that meant it was left for May and me. We worked tirelessly for days until finally we made our way to the basement. I flipped the basement light on from the top of the steps and sighed in annoyance when no light turned on in return. May and I peered down into the pitch darkness below. The concrete stairs seemed to stretch endlessly into the dark, even though I knew it only went down about 20 feet. This basement has always creeped me out. The way Papa locked it up so tight. I swear, I used to hear weird noises from down here when we were younger. We've been down there before, though, I objected. It's just boxes of Papa's old stuff. Once! We've been down there once for like two minutes when we were little. If it's just boxes, why would Papa have three deadbolts on the door? May held up the ring of keys as if to emphasize her point. Hell if I know, maybe he was worried someone will get hurt because the lights don't work? I responded jokingly, taking a step down the stairs. I have no idea. You figure out how to make this light work in this creepy basement, and I'll go into town to pick up lunch. My sister responded in a tone of voice that let me know she would not be going into the creepy basement. <laughs> sure, May. I rolled my eyes and let out a small chuckle. Thanks, Aaron. Mary rested her pale blue eyes on me and smiled warmly before scurrying off, long, dark hair trailing behind her. I pulled out my phone's flashlight and cautiously walked down the steps. As I made my way into the only part of the house where we had never been allowed in, an unpleasant, musky scent filled the air. My nostrils began to sting as my stomach turned. The smell increased in power with each step, and I had to make a conscious effort not to breathe through my nose. Something absolutely rotten was down here. Upon reaching the bottom of the steps, I noticed another light switch and decided to give it a try. For a few seconds, nothing happened, and then slowly, a few dim yellow lights buzzed to life. Gazing around, I saw nothing that would be given off such a foul odor. But I had to admit, May had a point. This basement was creepy. I could only see faintly by the flickering light that barely permeated across the basement, and the walls needed desperate help as the paint was hanging off in strips everywhere. On the far side of the room, blocked by several boxes, was a small door that presumably led to the septic tank. The place looked like a dungeon, to be entirely honest. Countless stacks of unmarked boxes were piled high around me, and I realized this was going to take hours. I let out a long sigh before beginning the laborious task of transporting them to the U-Haul in the driveway. An hour later, I barely made a dent and my back was aching. Deciding to take a break after the next box... I bent down as I attempted to lift it up. The bottom gave way and its contents haphazardly spilled out over the ground. Darn it, I shouted into the musky, humid air. I looked down at the spilled contents and realized there was a pile of leather journals at my feet. Defeated, I sat down on the cold concrete ground and grabbed the journal closest to me. It looked ancient, and the leather was soft and worn. I flipped the book around in my hands and noticed stitched on the spine, June 1950. Curiously, 
I unclipped the leather buckle on the journal and opened the front cover. Inside, there was a photograph taped to the back of the cover, and I pulled it closer to inspect it. The photo contained a couple in front of a few apple trees. The man looked familiar and appeared to be in his mid-twenties. He was smiling happily, and I noticed he was holding a small baby cocooned in a blanket. Laying her head almost against the man's shoulder was probably the most beautiful woman I have ever seen. She was pale in complexion, contrasted by long, jet-black hair. Her most captivating feature was probably her emerald-colored eyes that seemed to shine. I stared at her, mesmerized by her beauty. Eventually, my eyes darted to the familiar tooth-filled smile of the man for a few more seconds before realization dawned on me. This was a photograph of my grandfather, decades younger than I had ever seen him but him all the same. I wasn't sure why, but I started to feel uneasy. There was nothing wrong with the scene in the image itself, but something was poking at the corner of my mind, putting my flight or fight response on edge. I couldn't explain what, but there was definitely something very wrong with this picture. I stared blankly for a few moments before my eyes widened in disbelief. The image I was looking at was clearly old and the journal was dated for 1950. But this photo was high resolution with brilliant, vibrant color, clearly taken by an advanced camera, even by today's standards. I quickly flipped through the pages of the journal only to see page after page of handwritten words. I recognized my papa's handwriting and noticed that each entry was signed by him. I set the journal down and opened another only to see it too had a high definition photograph of my papa. This time, however, he was dressed in an army uniform, smiling from atop top of the largest horse I'd ever seen. Not just a big horse, but impossibly big. It was hard to tell without a better frame of reference, but the horse had to be nearly the size of an elephant. My papa had never been in the army. He had been an investment banker. This journal was also filled with handwritten entries from my grandfather. Some of the journals had photos, while some did not but they all were dated between 1948 and 1955. I found the earliest journal, which began March of 1948, and began to read. I'm not entirely sure what I should be writing here. Jade says, just write about my days and what happened, but it feels odd. It's for her, though, so I'll write. She told me she'll want to read all about my adventures after I get home from the war, and I suppose I best make life sound interesting for her. I'm at the station now, and I ship out in a few hours to Germany. The British Republic is advancing on Berlin at this very moment, and the American forces can't repel the United Powers, then there really is no hope for any of us. There's even been talk of a United Powers developing a new type of soldier, people with unimaginable strength and speed that can take down entire companies. Hey Erin! Food's here! I'm going to go hang out with Chelsea for a bit. Make sure you eat okay! Mary called from the top of the steps, her voice ripping me from the journal. Yeah, thanks. Uh, see you later, I mumbled as she left. I wasn't quite sure what I was reading yet, but I dove back in. Without losing a single man, I'm not sure how much I buy into it all yet. Sounds like ghost stories if you ask me. The Koreans may have a disgusting interest in eugenics, but nothing like that would be too much, even for them. Anyways, at least I get to ride the transatlantic hyperloop 
on the way to Europe. They say it only takes five hours to get across the pond in it. I love you, dearest Jade. Just as I finished reading the entry, I heard a loud thump and the sound of metal scraping against metal. I froze and listened again for several seconds until I heard the same metallic sound again, followed by a deep rumbling and hacking cough. My head whipped around, trying to zero in on the sound. The metallic scratching started again, lasting longer this time, and my stomach sank as I realized it was coming from the door to the septic tank area. Something or someone was making that sound. Now, I'm pretty fit, and I wrestled in high school, and admittedly, I have a decent-sized ego, while it may not have been the smartest thing to do, I wasn't too scared as I approached the door, confident that I would be able to handle whatever was on the other side. I wrapped my hands around the doorknob. After a deep breath, I threw the door open with one hand and the other hand I used my phone light to illuminate the dark space beyond. I gagged as a much stronger version of that horrible smell I'd almost grown accustomed to gushed into my nostrils, and nothing could have prepared me for what I saw inside the room. The floors and walls were encased in cement, the ceiling looked like it was made of steel, and a couple feet past the doorway, thick steel beams descended from the ceiling every few inches. It was a giant cage, and in that cage was the most horrific creature I'd ever laid eyes on. It was laying down, but I could tell it was easily seven feet tall. Its skin was sickly gray and littered with bumps and sores. Its muscles seemed ready to pop out of the skin. Around its neck was a sturdy-looking metal collar that had a long chain leading into the cement of the far wall. Between the smell and the sight, I bent over and I puked my guts out. When I looked back up, the creature was staring at me, and I saw its horrid, elongated face twist into a nasty snarl. It barreled its huge fangs at me and had moved into a predatory stance on all fours. It looked ready to pounce. My heart was pounding so desperately, I thought I was for sure having a heart attack. I stood there, frozen in fear. Just when I thought I was going to faint, I heard a voice from behind me. Ah, for effin' sakes. Still holding the creature's stare, I slowly turned around to see my great-uncle Tom standing behind me, a huge slab of meat in his hands. I heard the screech of the metal and whipped back around to see the creature launching itself at me, only to be yanked back by the chain. It snarled as it rose to all fours. Now that it was closer into the light, I could fully see its eyes. Its piercing, emerald green eyes. As I stared into those captivating green eyes, all sound seemed to fade away until I could only hear my heart pounding wildly in my chest. My mind flashed back to the photos of my grandpa and Jade, how her eyes had also been emerald green. The exact same emerald green. I stood there shell-shocked for what felt like ages until Tom roughly grabbed a hold of my shoulder and spun me around. You got questions, kid? and I suppose I got answers. Go wait for me upstairs. His thick southern draw hung over the words like a fog. His voice sounded almost identical to Pa's, save for the accent. Finally, I broke out of the trance-like state. What is that thing? Tension filled the air. Tom eyed me flatly, not giving away a single emotion on his flat face. She's, he trailed off, trying to find his words before starting up again. Listen, kid, I promise I'll answer all your questions, 
but you gotta wait upstairs. She ain't been fed in days, and I promise, my brother, I'd take care of her. Papa knew about- I started loudly before I was cut off by the snarl howl from the creature. Tom aggressively threw his pointer finger at the stairs, indicating for me to leave the room. Weighing my options, I decided to listen and step over towards the stairs. I looked back at Tom just as he slammed the door shut. I made my way through the long hallway that connected the east end of the house with the central hallway. I looked at the markings on the wall where Papa had liked to measure mine and May's heights for the first few years he had us, when we were still young enough to enjoy that sort of thing. I laid my hands on the grooves in the wood, the house that had been my home for the past ten years, now felt alien to me, like I was trespassing in a stranger's dwelling. Questions swirled through my mind. What the fudge was that thing? How long had it been there? What the heck were those journals? But above all, there was that one question haunting me most. Just who exactly was my grandfather? I sat there impatiently at the kitchen table for several minutes until I heard Tom make his way up the stairs. Without looking at me, he went to the kitchen sink and began thoroughly washing his hands. He sat down across from me and finally met my gaze. For some reason, I looked away sheepishly. Silence filled the room as I jumped when he reached into his jacket and slapped down a few journals I'd found. He folded his hands on the table and leaned back, still saying nothing. Throughout my life, I had never gotten to know my great uncle very well despite him only living 20 minutes down the road. As far as I knew, he was a very smart man, though you never know it from the way he spoke. I knew he made quite a career for himself working as some sort of military contractor, weapons development, or something like that. Tom had never gotten on well with my grandpa, only speaking to his older brother on a rare occasion and he spoke to May and I even less, regarding us with sheer indifference whenever he was around. How much did you read, kid? he asked curiously. Some, not much, I replied vaguely. Is that her down there, Jade? Nah, not for a long time now. That down there is what I call a failed fudging experiment. During the war... The United Powers were trying to create a super soldier of sorts to fight in the front lines. Almost did it too, until the U.S. developed the atomic bomb and threatened to use it. Brought things to a tidy, neat close. After the war, we confiscated the British and Korean research and... Stop fudging with me, I suddenly shouted as I pounded my fist down on the table. There was no war in the 50s where we fought the British. So stop fudging with me and start telling me the god darn truth. Or I swear to God I will call the police and let them deal with you and that fudging thing downstairs. I could feel my face growing red with anger. If Tom was surprised by my outburst, he didn't show it. If anything, he looked almost amused, which just served to tick me off even more. Right. I thought maybe you put it together by now. My brother said you were intelligent and all. He pondered for a moment before going on. Kid, I don't reckon you know much about quantum physics, string theory, Einstein's Rosen bridges, ringing a bell in that hot head of yours. It wasn't, but I didn't want to give him the satisfaction of telling him that. Get to the point. He smiled in a not-so-unkind way. Over here, Einstein and Rosen theorized that we were surrounded by microscopical wormholes that could theoretically transverse one through space and time. Neat theory and all, and they actually got most of that right. The discrepancies between most and all, though, is found in the actual function of some wormholes. 
instead of simply connecting to a different point in time and space, they actually connect different points in time, space, and realities. I wanted to yell again, tell Tom what he was saying was insane, but I held myself back, mostly because he seemed to be confirming what I had begun to suspect. He paused for a moment, sensing my indecision to protest his words. Once he was satisfied that I'd stay quiet, he went on. You get what I'm saying? Each of these bridges connect to different realities, different universes. Some are similar to yours, ours, some aren't so much. They all start the same way, with a big bang, and they all have the same fundamental laws of physics because of that. But at some point, they all go ahead and diverge. You still with me, kid? He paused for a moment, as if to get confirmation from me. There are some events that does and doesn't happen, and they're all progressively get more different. Me, your mama, Jade, and my big brother Justin were from one that's pretty close to this one, all things considered. Far as I can tell, divergence happened in 1678 when America split off from Britain almost a hundred years before it did here. Somehow, though, a series of cause and effect that event accumulated into different worlds. My world where technology was pretty darn far ahead of where it is here. Among some other things, like wars being fought on different schedules, with some different players involved, people there are different too, more intuitive. My mouth hung wide open at this point. This was effing insane. You said was. What do you mean technology was pretty far ahead, I asked suspiciously. Well, I was getting to that. After the war, we confiscated the research. Turned out they were using a strain of man-made virus to infect and alter people's DNA, turning them into stronger and faster things. I was just out of college when they brought that virus into the paramilitary facility I landed a job at. It should have been destroyed. It's unnaturally changing a human body like that. Eventually, the virus did what viruses do and it got out. It affected people. It mutated. It started changing people way past the initial scope of the project, turning them into mindless beasts. It spread like a gosh darn wildfire. Within a matter of weeks, the whole world was either turned or eaten, travels through fluid, so most bites will do the trick. And that's what happened to Jade down there. I didn't know she was infected until after we got here, and I never would have let her come otherwise. I wanted to put her down for the last 40 years, of course, but my brother refused, unable to part with his love of his life. God, we used to argue about it, but on his deathbed, my big brother begged me to take care of her until I couldn't. And of course, I couldn't deny an asking like that, could I? So here we are, kid. I gotta keep her alive, because to not would be spitting on my brother's memory. Upon finishing, Tom lay back in the chair and nodded towards me, as if to indicate that it was my turn to speak again. I was still unsure of what to believe at this point, but in my heart, I felt like what he was saying was true. However, improbable. Prove what you're saying is true. Show me. I demanded. Your grandma downstairs ain't good enough for you? He gave me a sharp laugh before staying up on his chair. Come on, then. Tom started walking out the back door that led to the yard and a forest beyond. He beckoned for me to follow, and we hastily made our way into the crisp winter air. I was led to the back end of the property where my papa's tool shed sat. Although we never had any reason to enter it, Papa had always kept it locked, citing theft concerns. Now I know, that wasn't the only reason. Tom entered the combination to the lock and swung the door open to reveal the shed's rather unimpressive contents. Tools layered the wall along with cobwebs and dirt coated the floor in a thick grime. It was clear no one had been in here Four years. Going to the back corner, 
Tom began tapping around the floor with his heavy boots, listening closely as he did so. Suddenly, he grabbed a crowbar from the wall and began prying up the floorboards. Come help me with this, he commanded, and I quickly stepped over to him and I saw a large, cube-shaped brown safe had been revealed under the floor, probably about two feet tall and two feet wide. I felt another pang of betrayal at yet another secret my papa had hid. The safe was deceivingly heavy, and it took us a couple of minutes to fully extract it from the floor and up onto the work table. Without me needing to prompt him, Tom entered in a combination and the safe swung open. Tom began carefully removing its contents. First, there was a picture of who I assumed to be my papa and Tom with their arms wrapped around each other's shoulders. Both young children. They were in New York City. I only knew it was New York because of the Twin Towers in the background, filling up the skyline. Next, he pulled out a wallet and removed several dollars of different denominations from it. The catch, though, was that these dollars were blue and had the face of men and women I've never seen before. I inspected them closely, and they certainly felt real. After that, he pulled out a revolver that belonged to a sci-fi movie. I don't know how to explain it, but when Tom lifted it up, it almost became alive. It morphed into around his hand. Neutral interface. Designed this myself, actually, Tom said as the gun morphed back into its original form. He set it down carefully. At this point, I'd have to say I was pretty convinced, but the next item he pulled out shredded any molecule of doubt I may have still been harboring. Tom pulled out a large spear that swirled with cosmic colors. Just by looking at it, it was clear that this was an alien object. I watched as it turned blood red at Tom's touch, and then swirled to cosmic purple, and then deep ocean blue. I reached for it, and Tom gripped my hand painfully. Don't. Don't touch this. Touchy and volatile to begin with. Might have gotten even worse after all this time. I looked at him quizzically. That's what got you here, isn't it? He nodded very seriously. And then my world came shattering down because it was at that exact moment I hear an ear-splitting scream echo across the yard from the house. My blood turned ice cold and my heart skipped a beat. I recognized that scream. That scream belonged to my sister. Without thinking, I grabbed the revolver sitting on the table behind me and sprinted towards the house, ignoring Tom's call after me. As I bursted through the backyard, I immediately recognized the unmistakable scent of blood. I heard a soft cry from the hallway leading to the basement and quickly turned the corner to see my twin sister collapsed against the wall. All around her was a pool of dark red blood that led down the hall to the basement. As I got closer, I realized the true horror of her wound. Her arm from the elbow down had been torn completely off. Shred of skin hung loosely over the wound as it poured seamlessly endless fountains of blood. Tom arrived behind me then, letting out a sharp gasp. It, it seemed nice. My arm, Aaron. It, it took my arm. It seemed nice. I... She weakly croaked out as I knelt down next to her. Shh. It, it's okay. It, it's going to be okay. I said in an attempt to calm her, even though my voice was shaking and cracking as I watched my sister bleed out. I pulled off my belt and began trying to tourniquet as I screamed for Tom to call for an ambulance. No point, kid. She ain't gonna die. She gonna turn. We gotta... We can't let her. He said softly. His voice still conveyed little emotion, but I thought I saw something like sadness flash in his eyes. Ignored him. I pulled out my own phone and called 911, giving them directions to my house before hanging up. I looked back at May and saw her eyes had rolled back in her head. She looked so pale. Save her, please! I looked at Tom, tears now streaming down my face. 
He looked down at the ground before responding. Kid, I helped universes to get away. There ain't no cure. My facility came the closest before I left, but we were still weeks, months away. We were getting overrun. She won't bleed out, but she's gonna go into coma and start changing. Couple of days, more if she's lucky, less if she ain't. I felt rage boil through me as I grabbed the gun and sprinted down to the basement steps. Aaron, no! Tom bellowed after me as I bolted into the room that held the creature. I slammed the door shut and locked it as Tom's body pounded into it on the other side. I felt a new wave of red, hot rage as I turned and saw the creature gnarling on my sister's arm. I paid no attention as I levered the revolver at its head. I felt the cold metal morph around my hand. It was an odd sensation, but it felt the neutral interface working and somehow knew the bullet would find its mark. With a simple thought, the gun blew a hole the size of a quarter through the head of that thing had once been my grandmother. No sound, no recoil. The creature howled and I shot again and again and again. Finally, it collapsed on the ground, dead. Tom was still pounding on the other side of the door, and as I opened it, he came crashing inside and looked at me with fury I had never seen before. He took a step towards me before I levered that gun at him, and he stopped in his track. You gonna fudge and shoot me? I swore to my brother I will keep her safe, but now look what you went and fudge and did. He spoke in a tone that was full of ice and fury. I took a deep breath. I steadied my breathing as I continued to aim down at my great uncle. I had a plan. Admittedly, a bad one. If I was right, I'd be able to save May. If I was wrong, I'd probably die for it. But I had to try. I had to try and save the only family I had left. I realized I could hear ambulance sirens in the distance, growing louder. I steadied my revolver. The time was now or never. You said yourself, Tom, your facility that came the closest to the cure. We need to go there. You're taking me there. The anger in Tom's face disintegrated instantly, replaced by pure fear. One note before we say our goodbye. Every Friday we'll have something going up now. This Friday, it will be a live stream of Among Us with Horror Narrators. The next Friday will be my day videos. I don't know about you guys, but I really did enjoy this story. I want to read you the next installment as soon as I can. If you enjoy this video, then hit that like button and make sure it feels it. Tell me down below if you liked my southern accent and, of course, about the story. If you want to help this channel, then subscribe and turn that bell to all notifications. If you want something out of it, I have merch, two different links for two different price points. If you want some early access to the audio and some other bonuses, check out my Patreon. But most importantly, thank you for watching. Sleep tight and don't let 42 bite.